All right, here we go. So a week or two ago, I did a video on the top 30 or so accessories for the mini mill. And that's from a novice perspective. And so I'm doing the same again this week for top however many accessories for the mini lathe. Targeted at the home user, the novice as I am. And so this is really just things that I have found useful so far. Now I'm going to probably cover a few things I've already touched upon. In fact, I'll start with the dials because I have touched upon those in the milling video, but I'll mention them again here. There's really two types you're going to have. This kind here, which measures a linear amount, in this case just over a centimeter. The other type is this one here, the dial test indicator. And these only measure about a millimeter or so, and therefore doing run out, you know, finding out if you're something on your lathe is, is running true. But you can also do that with this. It's not a problem. You can just point the point at your tool and it'll do the same thing. It'll rock back and forth. It's not really a problem. Either of those is fine. My only advice is get something that's a model up. These stands, of course, these magnetic stands are very important. I can put them there, for example. It can also be mounted, for example, on the back of the uh, slide here. It can go there, it can go up here, it can go on top there, it can go on the side of the case there, all kinds of places. But in order to do that, you should get one with a long enough arm. Just make sure you don't get one that's got miniaturized arms, as many on, um, on the cheap sites do. They sell these ones that are miniaturized. They look like they're the full thing, but they're not. Even the base here is made smaller. There's also these ones here with this type of stand. These work perfectly well as well. It's not really a problem to get those. All right, that's those things. I'll put that aside. The tool post. This is a big accessory. It's sort of beyond the scope of this video other than just to mention it. When you get a mini lathe, it's not going to have a quick change tool post. It's just going to have a square block where you can put your, your tools into it and screw them down. And you may even have to shim those tools up and down. If you have to shim them, get a cheap set of feeler gauges like this. And you can pull those out and you can use those to shim your blades up and down because that's the only adjustment is you have to do it with some kind of shim. You can't go down either, it's only up. <laughs> so, so uh, Pretty quickly you find you're going to want a quick change tool post and that's sort of your first big cost with a mini lathe is getting one of these. There's a whole video on my channel about this one. It's called the Multifix Tool Post. This one here is a type AB. They're not common, but they're the best one for this particular lathe. The types refer to the sizes of the whole thing. And if you can find one that fits your, fits your post here, um, without modification, great. If you get a smaller or a bigger one, you'll probably have to modify things. Figuring out what's the ideal size for your lathe is a real, can be a bit of a job. This particular post is called a Multifix, which is an old design. I think it's Swiss. I'm, I'm not looking that up now, but I think it's Swiss from a long time ago. These are, of course, all Chinese. And uh, benefit of this is this particular design with these, this, these flutes on here. It's very stable and it's a 40 position. You can position it anywhere else um, around and lock it like that, which is just nice and convenient. You don't have to really undo anything. So that's a really nice tool post. The other types of posts, just cover them quickly, that you'll see mostly are a block. And they've got dovetails on two, if not four sides. They're very popular, especially in the States, because I think these are more popular in Europe. Consider that to be a must-have item. I have seen people on YouTube, they're still using their clamp-down ones. More power to them. Um, if they're happy to do that and their tools are all working, great. You know, you might get away with that. Brushes. I mentioned this in my other video. These are um, detailing brushes from an auto parts store. Just count on getting a few of these brushes. You use them all the time. And so that one lives there. Your lathe may have come with some accessories and when you're buying it, you know, maybe look for a kit that comes with certain accessories. This came with a couple of things, but not everything. So obviously you're gonna get a three jaw chuck with it. 
that'll come with that, but you're gonna sort of want to have on hand a four jaw chuck like this with independent jaws. So each jaw has its own, its own adjustment. They're a pain in the butt to use, but with this, you can of course get it more accurately centered than with that because it has got that adjustment. Um, so in this case, it didn't come with it, but it was a pretty cheap accessory that they sold. So definitely got that at the same time. All right, the next thing relates to that. This is a little bit more obscure, and this one didn't come with it, but a lot of lathes do come with this part right out of the box. I had to source this because it's not available here. And this is a faceplate here. So you take your chuck off and you screw this on and you can then bolt things to that. And for this particular lathe, this is a 72 millimeter cutout. When I was looking for these, I couldn't find anyone who would, who would actually state the figures. They, they give you this measurement, but not that. And they wouldn't even show you a picture of that. But I finally got the guy at Warco in the UK to measure it. On my second request, he did. He ignored my first one but I wanted him to say what was on the rear and how big it was. And then he said, okay, yes, it's a 72 millimeter. And that's what fits these 100 millimeter chucks. They've got that um, cut out. And the front was uh, 170. And so that's really nice. This is very much identical to the one that Optimum show on their website, but it's just not available down here where I live. And you've also got to have these um, posts get those as part of that. Some lathes will come with these. As if you put a part in your chuck, the longer it gets, the more unstable it is. And there's some rule of about, you know, one to three or one to two. That is, that's as far as you should go out before supporting the end in some way. And so the most common way to support is to drill a little hole in the end and then use a live or a dead center here at the rear, just poked into it. And you'll see this every lathe video you look at. If you're doing a cut somewhere here in the middle and you've got an end piece sticking out, say this is a, a long bar, well, somewhere along the path, I can install this and it clamps to the bed and it'll just hold the end. And you do your work on this side here. I guess you could also do some on the other side, like say if you were trying to cut a thread on a long piece, you could actually do that as well. Now the other one is the follower. So this one mounts on the front of the skirt or apron or whatever you want to call this um, big slide here. There's some holes in the front and it mounts there. And so this one travels with the cutting tip. It moves with it. And it's always very close to the cutting tip. So it's actually supporting you can see how it's supporting the piece right next to your cutting, where you're cutting. Next part that's on the lathe are your centers here at the back. The stuff you're going to put in here. I've got a couple of points to make about these. So just then I cracked it out. When you move this to a certain point, there's a, a rod in there that pushes on the back and pushes this out. In this particular case, this is an MT2, a Morse Taper 2. Um, this is a live center, which spins. There's also dead centers like this, which do not spin. And you put a bit of lube on them. Most lathes come with a dead center or even two. And the live centers are just a little bit of a, a step up from that. Another variation on that is this here. It's a half dead center. And so it's half cut off. And you use that in cases well, you've got that in there and if you want to cut a thread all the way to the end here and if your part is narrow enough that the actual tip here would be in the way of your cutting tool or your tool post the half center gives you that room to get in there now a point to make about these tapers especially for anyone who has this particular lathe when you buy, now I haven't got one to show, but when you buy these arbors, so this is an MT2, Morse Taper 2 to JT6, which is the drill chuck arbor, they don't come like this. They actually have a piece here on the end, like a tab that sticks up. If you 
try and put that in there, it won't go into the end. I've actually caused the problem right now. This one here is cut to a length where at a certain point that rod pushes it out. And it happens just before this thing reaches the end of its thread. Now if your taper rod here is too short, it won't hit that rod before it runs out of thread. And so that's what's happened here. I cut that one down and I tried to go for the maximum available because I wanted to gain the most amount of space here. And I did it a millimeter too far and this is what happened. So now it doesn't come out. You see, I have to get this out some other way, you know, it wasn't too tight. But that's what I did here. I cut this off. I had to buy another one. Thankfully, they're not very expensive. So the next one I purchased, and it has the drill chuck on it because it works. This one's the right length. There's an extra millimeter or two on the end, and that fits perfectly. Because out of the box, if you leave that tab on, you're taking away about 13 to 15 millimeters of your width. And you very soon find out with these mini lathes, you want every centimeter of width you can get. So taking off that, getting that extra one and a half centimeters is worth it. And so now that chucks in there. I can wind this all the way to the zero mark. And when I go past it, there, and then crack. And that's the end. And then there's not even half a turn left. So that one's cut just right. How did I cut that? These are very, very hard steel. Um, if I have some video, I'll put that in here and if I can find it, but if I can't, I'll just explain what I did with this was I put it in the drill, drill chuck like that and then I put a big fat drill in here and I put that drill, put the tip into my chuck here and tightened it up. So everything was pretty tight and pretty accurate. Now then I set it spinning and I used a one millimeter um, disc on my mains powered angle grinder. I just sat here and I just cut it like that. Just slowly let it spin and I cut it. I got a superb finish. You know, very nice finish on the end there. And then when I was finished, I held some emery up against it just to clean it as well. And so that was really nice cut. I made the point in my other video to get one of these chucks, not one of these. So this was a mistake I made. I bought this one thinking, oh, that'll be nice. Use a, Just use my hands to tighten and undo it. And a very nicely made um, chuck this. It's quite beautiful. But the amount of space you lose is huge. And so really they're no good at all. You've got to get one like this size, gain that space. Uh, another point that the seller made to me later on, I think with these ones, is that if they jam while you're using them, they can tighten down so tight that you just can't get them undone, only with great difficulty. There's another tool here. Where is that? This one. I've used this quite a few times, and I complain about it every time I use it. So this was a cheap set, and these are all over eBay and places. It always looks the same. It's this set. And uh, it's a die holder for when you're cutting threads. And this set is quite nice because it comes with the three different sizes. And the whole thing mounts. This one's an MT2. And that's got that um, tab, you see there on the end? I need to cut that off. So that goes in the end in your tailstock holder. And then these bits here go on the front. And this is just for running a die along a rod to cut a thread on it. My complaint about it is the length but otherwise it works very well for cutting threads. Oh, that thing also has a tap holder in it as well, so you can run a thread into a hole, that's no problem. That's been good to have, happy I've, I'm happy I've got that. Oh no, one more thing that goes in the tailstock, and I could have touched upon this with the milling machine. Uh, I spent a long time looking for these. Reamers, I'll talk about reamers. Hand reamers and chucking reamers. These are chucking reamers. They're designed to go into a chuck and you get a perfect finish on that hull because a drill doesn't give you a perfect finish. The reamer does. The affordable set that I've got here, this came from eBay from China and was actually very affordable. I just went, okay, it's 21 bucks American or something. 
and a few dollars shipping. I'll just take a risk. If it doesn't show up or if it's garbage, we'll, we'll find out. And they're very nice. So that's a 10 piece set. There are a lot of uh, seven or eight piece sets, but have a look for the 10 piece set, which is this one here. And so you get from a couple of millimeters all the way up to 12, which is really nice. And these are straight ones, straight flutes on them. The ideal would have been to get ones with um, spiral flutes because then they pull all the material out. You've got to be careful with these that you keep taking out your material, you know, as you go in, because if these get stuck, it's a big problem and they're very easy to get stuck. Um, the straights are not great, but so long as I'm careful with my chips, they will be good. I could not get spiral ones anywhere without paying a ridiculous price. And so this was the best option. The alternative that you'll keep seeing are these adjustable reamers and they've got a mechanism where the reaming blades can be pushed in and out. So you set them up for any size. I nearly made the mistake of getting those. They're not for this purpose, they're for hand reaming out holes. And at some point I'll probably get a set because the benefit with those is if you've drilled a 10 millimeter hole and you just want to clean it up, make it super smooth inside, and you don't care if it's going to be 10.3 or something, you can use one of those. Whereas if I use this, this, it wouldn't work. On the tool post, there's a whole lot of stuff to deal with here. Let's start with something you wouldn't have expected. That would be the knurling tool. So there's a lot of choice in knurling tools. You'll see these ones that squeeze down onto your part and you'll see ones that basically look like that and you push them against the part. Now, anyone can see that it seems better to squeeze it with a screw like this because you're not putting any sideways pressure on your, on your bearings, anything like that, on your part. See, your part doesn't get pushed out of alignment or anything, you're just squeezing it. So that seems to be the better choice. This is a Garvin. This was pretty cheap, but it was pretty awful too. I've used it in some of my videos. I got a nice cut in my last one, um, but I found that it wasn't giving me the same pressure on both sides and it was because of the way it was put together. So I stripped it apart. So one side would get stiff is what would happen. One side would lock up and the other side would come down. It was, just wasn't working right. So I pulled it apart and rearranged, rearranged these things, put washers in there, a different spring on it, and that works very well. That's actually really nice now. You can do a very small knurl by shifting this to there, for example, or a very large one by shifting that out there. The knurling tool is fun. It's one of those finishing things that looks cool when you're finished and everyone thinks, ooh, you're a machinist, because you've done that cool little finish. When you show them the part you made, that's the bit that the uninitiated will always look at and go, how did you do that? So, lathe tool bits. This is, of course, is a biggie. Now, when you first bought your mini lathe, you probably saw or were offered one of those blue tool sets, especially if you bought a Sieg because they make those tool sets in eight millimeter rods, which is what the Sieg's need, the small ones, the C2s and the C3s. They have carbide inserts welded or brazed onto the end. You can't really sharpen them easily. So they're sort of a one-off. You use them until they stuff up and then that's it. But because they're so very cheap and they come in a set, often in a little box with a whole bunch of different different tips, you think, okay, that looks great. I'll get that, that'll get me going. Well, it'll, it'll get you out of the store and it'll get you home, but you're gonna want something a bit, bit uh, more upmarket than that. And the choices are, cut your own steel, like this, these things. There's another one. The other choice is these sets of insert tools, like this. And they often come in these little boxes here and they come with a whole lot of different tools. And so they look really nice. And you look at those and you think, oh, that'd be nice. I'll get that and get that'll get me going. And it will. And so that's another option. A similar option to that one is this set, which was my first set. And it had a whole bunch of different tools. And I thought, oh, that'll get me going. And then from there, we move on to the preformed steel sets like this. And the same again, like that. This 
carbon insert set that I thought would get me going did get me going and I still use this more than any of the other ones. It's a funny set because all of them, one, two, three, four, five tools, they all use exactly the same triangular insert. It's the same insert on a different angle. That's really all it is. So that's a little bit boring, but it works. What it hasn't got is thread cutting. There's no groove tool, there's no parting tool, there's no threading tool, certainly no internal threading tool or anything like that. But the actual inserts work well and they give me a nice finish and I've been quite happy with that. So that's one sort of set, but be aware it's not really complete. It doesn't give you everything. Then I purchased a set that was similar and it was a very good price and it had even more than this, but it was a different set. It had a lot of different tools in it. So it has a sort of a flat diamond, a very sharp diamond, and here a threading um, insert there. Also had this here, which is a grooving tool. It's not a parting tool, even though you can use it for minor parting tasks. We'll cover that in a moment. So this set I got because I wanted, I was missing those more specialized tools, such as the grooving parting one and the thread cutting. And there's also here the boring bar that it has. And I used this in one of my videos recently, I think the custom washers. And I ran into a problem with this whereby the shank here, it widens after the first couple of centimeters. And the, because it widens, if you've got everything straight, well, the widening causes the tool to deflect once you've gone in that far. So that's a bit of a pain. I had to use it on an angle in the end. I bought that set because I wanted more variety. The next type are these preformed high-speed steel. HSS sets. Now these are always made in India. I think these are generally Chinese and these are generally Indian. And you can get these very nice looking sets. They look better in real life than the photos often on the websites or on eBay. They often look terrible. But once you get them, I guess if you're lucky, they're very nice, beautiful tools. Now I got these as, these are 3 8 which fit, fit my 10 millimeter um, holders. When you buy these, same as with those inserts, look very carefully at each one and determine what it's for and make sure you're getting what you want. I was looking for a boring bar like that. Uh, this is a groove tool, not really a parting tool. It's too wide to do parting, but it's nicely made. Certainly do a good job for grooving. Yeah, very nice. It's got a taper here, meaning it's ground in there so that it doesn't grab. And it has a outside threading tool here and facing tools and so on and so forth and that's a nice set now the, the point with these is they may be preformed but they're not ready to use and you'd actually want to use at least use a stone to sharpen them if not your actual wheel to get them into shape so these are mostly ready to go not necessarily ready to go i also purchased a small set so these are three eighths so that's like 10, centimeter, 10 millimeters, and then there was like an eight millimeter. Is that five sixteenths? Is that what that is? And then there's the smallest, which is the quarter inch, about six millimeters. And so I got the, the large one and then the small one. And they're similar tools, not exactly the same. And the reason for this is because once you've got an adjustable tool holder, you can use any of these sizes. I can even use 12 mil, bigger ones. That gives you the option of using a smaller tool for a smaller thing that you're working on. And if you want to get into a very small piece to do some internal boring, and it was the boring that sort of got me onto this whole issue, was that the boring tools don't really fit. This is too big for that. But this one here is not too big for that. And so that's the point here of the different size sets. Once you've got an adjustable holder, it opens up all these different size sets. But again, I had to study what the tools were very carefully just to make sure that they had the tools I wanted. As I say, this one doesn't have an internal threading tool. doesn't matter. I wouldn't use that for internal threading. I'd use this kind of tool, the carbon insert one on the inside. And I got these again because once you're buying something, you're getting it shipped. Sometimes it's 
cheap enough to just add an extra set. And so those two sets I got from the same place and was happy with those. Very nice. Ones you cut yourself, you buy bits of tool steel like this. Three eighths would be the normal size for this lathe. And uh, I also got some twelves. I didn't know when I bought these, I didn't know what I was going to be using for cutting, what would be the best size. In the end, I've been doing the using the three eighths, which are just under 10 millimeters. And I've cut my tools with that. I didn't do a great job. It was, it was my first ones, but they've all worked very well. So I do think whatever you get, you should also plan on cutting your own because you'll be cutting them for special purposes. In fact, my fly cutter, you have to cut them yourself. And that's why I have these quarter inch ones. And so you plan on making your own tools for specific jobs. And as part of that, it's very important to get, I don't know if we can see over here, my grinding machine, which I've put on the table there. Those are aluminum oxide grinding wheels. You need those to grind the steel. I purchased a 60 and a 120. They're called white wheels. I was told I would just need the 60, but in the end, no, it's not that great. I find the 60 is too rough. I can certainly cut something down quickly with the 60, but if I want to get a nice finish on it, even the 120 is not that great a finish. Um, you need these, like a wheel dressing tool. I don't find that helps that much. I can certainly smooth it out with this, but it's still doesn't make that much of a difference to the finish on the tool. And so, of course, we have to use these kinds of stones. I use a cheap one here like this. And because you're often using a tool like that and grinding it into the, you know, you're, you're stuffing up the flatness of your stone. Because of that, I keep a second stone, which is my quality one. And this one I'm very careful with. Uh, so that's why I keep that one. And it's finer as well. And then in addition, having one of these, a little handheld one, that's really useful because when your tool's on your machine, you might often want to do that. So having a small handheld, a fine one, is uh, useful. Now the last thing with the tools is parting. This is a huge problem, is parting, especially on a mini lathe. And in my videos, I didn't leave out when I had problems with parting, I left it in because uh, I think it was important to show. My first parting tool was this one here. And this is a terrible parting tool. I think it's garbage. You'll see these in different sizes. This is the middle size. There's a smaller and a larger one. I don't think they're any use at all. The whole design, the way it holds the tool, this little clamp on top, it's just screwed down. You basically push your finger against it and screw it down. It doesn't hold anything. There's really very little rigidity in this tool. I think it's garbage. I don't like it. I would not buy that again. And that's the one I've had the most trouble with. Um, and so this is the much more substantial version of that other one. It's a bigger piece of metal. It's much stronger. The holder is much beefier. It's got two screws set uh, further apart. And this slot that it gets clamped down into, it's got angled cutouts so that as it's screwed down, the blade is pulled tight against the face of the holder. So it's absolutely rigid. Uh, the blade is also tapered like that to stop material binding on it and stop it overheating. And you can also cut your own, well, you have to cut your own tip into it, your own cutting edge. And if you want, you can make that edge not flat like that, but on a slight angle like that, which you might want to do so that your the piece you're parting off is the cleanest, has the least amount of burr left on it, because that gets cut first by the piece, and then the burr mostly remains on the bit on the other side. So this is a very much an improvement on the previous tool. These things here... Um, this is a carbon insert tool. Now, often these little sets of tools come with one of these, and they'll often say it's a parting tool, but it's not a parting tool. It's a grooving tool, which is very similar. But a grooving tool tends not to have a great depth to it. But they're nice and skinny, which is good. They've got a little tip in it, which is good. It's held in quite well with this screw system, which is good. The bad bit is that the... Um, 
the sides of the tool here, especially on this cheap one, it's not made for parting. It's just made for cutting a little groove in there. So the sides are not in good condition. If you run your finger along it, it's, it's got all kinds of edges, like there and there. And those catch, and they mark your piece. So as you're cutting through it like that, those bits of metal there would stuff this up, this surface. I wouldn't get a clean surface. And so that's really no good for parting. It's just for grooving. A parting tool of that type is this one. And I think this is the best tool uh, for your parting. On a mini lathe, get a two millimeter. They usually come in two and three. Two is plenty. You want it to make as small a cut as you can. These let you extend it out quite far. And these holders, even though they look like it might just pop out, it doesn't. The tool squeezes itself into the uh, slot and gets tighter and tighter. And of course, you can get all these replacement tips for it. And that's a very good parting tool. Going to do very nice, sturdy holder. Same thing with the uh, chamfer on both those clamping edges so that it pulls the tool tightly against the um, against this uh, interface here. And that's very nice. It's actually a little bit more compact than this one. And uh, that all helps with the rigidity. These two together are, those, those are getting me through at this point. It's a little bit of an expense to buy these two um, separately. And so that's my comment about parting tools. Okay, moving along. Now back to the chuck accessories. I failed to mention one. In my video about the mill, I talk about not getting a drill chuck for it, but getting a, an ER32 collet holder. Because ultimately, this is your precise way of doing work in that. And all your stuff, all your drills and all your mills and end mills, they all go into this. Once you've made that expense and you've splashed out on this set, you know, that's a lot of money to spend. I think for the, for the lathe, it's the quick change tool post. For the mill, it's the, that kind of ER32 set. On the mill, I showed how you can also get the ER32 blocks for cutting like six-sided bolts or square things. They go in the vise and you put your work and they take one of these one of these holders and so you're reusing those for that purpose well the same thing applies here to the lathe you can get one of these and again it's the 72 millimeter for the 100 mil chuck and you've got that precision uh, work holder right there using those er32 collets so that's just a nice way to standardize your tools on a certain type of holder a lot of people I'm finding on Facebook and in forums, are, they're, they're not really talking about mini milling or mini lathes. They're talking about more pro level stuff, bigger machines. And as you go up, you do need better tool holding. But at this level, the ER32 seems plenty strong enough. And so uh, pick your size and just stick with it. Drilling. Something you're always doing on a... Uh, on a mini lay, there's drilling from the back here. And you're gonna either center drill for the sake of uh, putting your center in the hole. And the center drills are these things. I guess a uh, set like that, this has been fine. That wasn't too expensive a set and essential to have. Once again, this set here is extremely useful. I tried to buy metric and then finally realized that you can't get them in metric. And so it's all these funny sizes, the letter sizes, the numbers 1 to 60, letters A to Z, and then also just diameters. The nice thing about this set is there's a drill for almost any purpose, any size hole you want to cut. There's 115 size holes between what must be about a millimeter and what is probably about 13 millimeters, one half an inch, 115 sizes in between there. So that, that covers probably almost anything metric you need to do, especially in combination with these um, reamers. So with this set, I can cut a hole that's just a tad under 12 millimeter, put my 12 millimeter reamer in, I've got a beautiful 12 meter, millimeter hole. With my other set, which is more typical to buy at the hardware stores, these 
sets that go up a half a millimeter at a time from 1 to 13. With those, I'd have to go for 11 and a half millimeters. So the reamer would have to deal with a full half a millimeter, which is quite a bit. These are nice to have, and I use these for most work. Just a hardware store set, good quality set. And these are my preferences to use that first. But if I need something more precise, I'll go to this set and use that. This is the cheap set of these types. If you go on eBay or wherever and you search for 115 piece drill set, you can get these in different qualities and they can get very expensive, but it's always sort of the same set. That's been nice, been very happy with that set, mainly because it gives me the size I'm looking for almost every time. Uh, and for really getting messy, I just have one of these cheap, real cheap hard restore sets. This is more of a drill press type of tool. That's where I'll use, use these um, if I think I might break the tool. When you're trying to cutting a hole into and the end of your workpiece, is you've always got a target inner diameter you're aiming for and the question you have is well how am I going to get to that diameter and especially if your workpiece is solid you know like this and you're just going to have to start drilling in there and yes you start with a drill and you go up in your drill sizes and then at a certain point you've got to switch to a boring bar instead of the drill and then start cutting out with a boring bar and in my custom washers video of course I get into that your drills usually top out at 12 or 13 millimeters, like a half inch. And if they do, that step between a half inch and whatever your next size is, uh, this kind of thing is what's useful. So these are reduced shank drill bit sets. And so reduced shank just means that it's big there, but on the back it's still a 12 or a 13, so it fits in your average drill chuck. This was a cheap set that was on sale. I'm always saying cheap set. <laughs> It's because I can't afford to buy stuff. But for drilling out those aluminum washers that I was making, this is perfect. And I ended up going from 18 to 22 or some, some amount that was a total of five millimeters of material. And it worked perfectly. And so that's quite nice. And certainly by the time you're about here, you can get your boring bar into it. Wasn't too expensive. There are smaller sets that you can get. And the difference, of course, is not just the start and end size, and your start should of course be bigger than half an inch because it's a step up from your standard set. And the end is often around 30 or 32, and it's how many steps there are in between. So there was a set that was about five steps in between, but I thought that's not really that great. I wanted more steps in between. Some of the steps are very small, they're only 24 to 25, and then it's to 29, which is a big step. Just look at those and decide you know, it's a little bit of a luxury to have. It's quite nice, though. I like it. Not so obvious accessories. And I mentioned this tool here, this, this gadget here, which is just a simple LED light. It's on a gooseneck, really nice, really bright. And I can clamp it to shelves, clamp it to the back of the lathe or wherever. I really like that, and that's been very useful. Magnifier. If you're going to be looking like how you've lined up your cutting tip to the uh, center line. A magnifier can be very useful. I found this one's quite nice. Got a little light in it. It's got two strings, so that's quite nice. Any magnifier will do. And in fact, I suggest, I see people using those, those hoods that have a little shade on top and they've got a strap around the back and they've got magnifiers that you flip down. I've had those years ago when I was doing camera work. And they're just terrible. They give you headaches. They're a pain in the butt to use. They're always in the way. You're hitting things. I suggest going to a, a, any store, go to the supermarket, and get reading glasses. And get them in or one and a half, two and a half, three and four, or something like that. And just keep those handy, even if you're not blind, or going blind like us old people. And you can keep them on the tip of your nose, uh, plus two or plus three, and that way you can just tilt up and just get this fantastic magnification just by tilting your head a little bit. And they tend to fit behind safety glasses and uh, shades, of course, whereas those big hoods that you get over the top of your head, well, they're not going to fit behind safety glasses, are they? And so in favor of those, get reading glasses. That's another tip. 
And one last item I've just spotted here. These sets are really cheap. You get them for almost nothing. You wonder, well, are they going to be any good cheap like that? And yeah, sure they are. You squeeze them together, tighten it up so it's like that. This is for measuring internal diameters. Loosen it so it's now tight in there. Tighten it up again, pull it out, and then you use your calipers to measure that. And there's not really a lot that can go wrong. I mean, you can't really make them imprecise, so they work perfectly well at the price. So that was a nice set to have, and I have used that for internal diameters. It's a little bit more convenient than trying to always stick your caliper tips in there. Um, this is just a little bit easier to do. Uh, I didn't also mention these two items in the milling video, but I better do it here. It's a half and die set, because you're going to be using this until you start cutting um, your own threads. Uh, this is, of course, the easier way to do it. We all know not to buy those $10 sets. They're rubbish. Last thing you want is your taps, you know, breaking off in your workpiece. Get yourself a nice set of taps and dies, reasonable quality. And uh, that's what I've done here. It's been quite nice. I've cut quite a few threads. Always worked, not had any problems. So the next thing is measuring tools. I've probably got more than one would need. And I'd suggest uh, as a beginner, if you're trying to save money, the minimum you're going to need here is a analog or a digital caliper. You know, these cheap ones are everywhere. Be aware that some of them are plastic. So if you're looking at a catalog, they don't tell you, but they're often plastic here. I mean, get the metal one at least, because you're going to want to score something with the tips, especially if it's your cheap one. So that, that'll get you going and get almost, you know, any measurement you need, you can do with that. And you can wreck that because it's pretty cheap. Now the next step up, I also spent, years ago I got these, um, and I have a nice set, and it's beautiful. Compared with that other one, this one operates beautifully. It's really nice. It feels precise, everything's nicely machined. I got a 200 rather than a 150. And uh, there's also 300s, but it's all of a sudden it's starting to get a little bit long. I think the 200 is a good compromise. Uh, a little bit more of a luxury is this set, which is the micrometers. The reason I got this set was the, the deal. You can get a single one for quite cheap. They're analog. There are digital ones as well. These analog ones are nice once you've figured out how to read them, which is a little bit weird. And these are very nice. At a minimum, you can pick up one of these that size. I think the nicer option is to also have one size up because then you can cut something. You might, you might be cutting something 50 mil, two inches on your lathe, but you might not be cutting three or four inches. And so that size there is also nice to have. These are getting into sort of really nice to have tools. The big ones, you're probably not going to use those on your lathe or your mill. But um, if you have a motorbike and you're working on an engine, well, yes, you, you probably will use those. So that's the point of those. Fluids. I covered all this in my milling video, but hey, here we go again. Oil for the machine. Very important. Well, in some cases, this is about lubricating something for the purpose of making it run smoothly, smoothly and lasting longer. And that would be, for example, there. The bearings. That has thrust bearings there. There as well. The ways. This is really about getting oil on the ways without having to smear it all over yourself. The other main purpose of this is to rub it all over anything that's metal, just to stop it rusting. And it doesn't really matter what you put on there. If you go researching, you might end up with the 60-something weight, like 68. A knowledgeable chap I spoke to when I described this to, he said to use a 46. And this is a better weight for these machines. And so I use that. Keep it in the bottle. Use it for everything. That's nice. The other one is cutting fluids. So if you've watched my videos, you've seen me use this one. The nice thing about this one is it sticks to the item you're cutting. So it doesn't immediately go splashing all over the place. And that's been okay. It's pretty gluggy. It's certainly nice to have the plastic tip on it. Much, much lighter is the uh, CRC. 
WD-40 type of material, not silicone, but the oil type, which is basically a kerosene and light oil mix, especially for aluminum. That works well, it keeps the material from getting stuck in your tool, especially if you're using inserts, because the aluminum will, will get stuck on there and start to build up. And this basically deals with that. Very easy to apply as well. There are other cutting fluids that are much more of a liquid, just a water, a water-based cutting fluid, this sort of thing. I have used it, but it seems to me that this would make more sense if you were using it in a pump system. It serves as a cooling fluid more than this does. And also, don't be afraid of not using any lube. Depending on how it cuts, you'll soon figure out that if it's cutting easily, if it works well, it's not it's not building up on the tool. You don't, and if it's not hot, then you can cut without any lubricant. Um, I found that the lubricant can sometimes cause, uh, certainly encourage, slipping of the tool. So instead of your tool catching the metal and starting to cut, if you've got lubricant there, you're of course encouraging the tool to slide. And if it slides too much, you can work harden the metal. If you're cutting steel, you make it slide, the metal hardens, and then you just can't even get it to bite. And in some cases, maybe just cutting dry, certainly to get that cut going, just let it dig in. Uh, seems from my experience so far, which is not extensive, but that's, that's the impression I get, is that lubricant doesn't necessarily always help. Engineers marking ink. This is the stuff that um, takes a little while to dry and once it's dry it really stays put. So if you're making marking up a part where you need marks on it for many different cuts and purposes over time you'd use that. Um, but if you're just making a quick mark on something these kinds of cheap markers are nice. It's got to be blue so you can look like a pro. Uh, these are great. This is a dollar store item and uh, just if you're making one mark, you just want to see it, that's good. Comes off with your lubricant and with your fingers though, so just be aware of that. Scribes, I like the single-ended one because the double-ended one, I just end up sticking myself with it, so I'm using the single-ended one. I think that covers everything, so uh, again, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, comment, ask me anything, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.